You will hear a number of different recordings and you'll have to answer questions on what you hear. There'll be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you'll have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you'll be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You'll hear someone booking transport for a trip. First, you have some time to look at questions one and two. You'll see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Burnham Coaches. Sarah speaking. How can I help you? Ah, yes. Good morning. I'm a teacher at the Down Language School. We have a bit of a problem, and I was wondering if you could help us out. The man says he is a teacher, so teacher has been written in the gap. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one and two. Good morning, Burnham Coaches. Sarah speaking. How can I help you? Ah, yes. Good morning. I'm a teacher at the Down Language School. We have a bit of a problem, and I was wondering if you could help us out. What is the problem exactly? Well, we normally take our students on an excursion at the end of their course, but unfortunately, the coach firm we normally use has let us down. It seems they've gone out of business. I'm sorry to hear that. I suppose you are looking for a replacement. Well, yes. We won't need a very large coach, actually. There will be thirty students and four teachers. So that's thirty-four in all. And what dates did you have in mind? The last Saturday and Sunday of this month. That's the twenty-eighth and twenty-ninth. The twenty-eighth and twenty-ninth. Does that mean you are planning to stay somewhere overnight? That's right. Actually. We want to do the same excursion that we do every year. We usually visit Stonehenge, Salisbury, and stay overnight in Bath. It's a historical tour, really. It sounds interesting. Let me just see what we have available. Oh dear, I'm afraid all our coaches are booked out for the twenty eighth. It's the busiest time of the year for us, actually. I was afraid that would be a problem. But you have a coach available for the twenty ninth. Yes, we do, and it's available for the thirtieth as well. If that's any help to you, I'm afraid not. Sunday is the last day. The students go home on Monday. I think we'll just have to change our plans a bit and leave out Salisbury. It's a shame, but I don't think we can fit in all three places in one day. So you would like to book the coach for the twenty ninth, visiting Stonehenge and Bath. Is that right? Yes, I think so. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions three to ten. Now listen and answer questions three to ten. Right, I just need a few details, sir. Okay, my name is Paul Scott. S C O T. It's double T, actually. I'm sorry, and it's the Down Language School. Could you give me the address for that, Mr. Scott? Yes, it's Down House. Hill Street, Brighton. 
Do you need the postcode? No, that's not necessary, but I do need a contact number. Of course. The number for the school secretary is 01273 512 634. You can contact her if you need to speak to anyone. Right. And what time would you like the coach to pick you up? Well, I think we'll have to make an early start. Would 7.30 be all right? Yes, no problem at all. What time do you want to be back? Oh, any time between 10 and 11 will be all right. Not later than 11, though. Right, I'll make a note of that. 11pm latest. There's just one more thing I need to know. Presumably, you'll be visiting Stonehenge first. How long do you want to stay there? Well, we normally stay about an hour. The main objective of the excursion is for the students to see the Georgian architecture in Bath, really. Yes, Bath is lovely, isn't it? I was there myself a couple of years ago. I thought the Royal Crescent was absolutely stunning. I hadn't realised how large it is. Well, I think that's all I need to know, Mr Scott. Thank you for booking with us. Just a minute. There's one thing you seem to have forgotten. How much will this cost? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I was thinking about Bath. Just bear with me a moment. Yes, it's a round trip of 300 miles and a total time of 16 hours for the driver. For a 45-seater coach, that will be a total of £500, including tax and insurance. Do we have to have such a large coach? There are only 34 of us. We don't have any smaller coaches, I'm afraid. Oh, well. At least we won't be cramped for space. When do we have to pay? We require a 20% deposit to confirm the booking. I suggest that you do that as soon as possible, today if you can. The balance you can give to the driver if you're paying by cheque. Have the cheque made out to Burnham Coaches. I think that'll be all right. I will have to check this with the school accountant, but if all is well, I'll arrange for someone to bring you the deposit within the next two hours. That'll be fine, Mr Scott. Well, thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a news broadcast on a radio station. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the news broadcast and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning and welcome to 2RC, your local radio news service for the Wesley area. And here are your headlines for this morning. More news from the police into the jewellery robbery that occurred last Tuesday in the centre of town. Comtech, the local computer hardware manufacturer, has announced that it must cut 40 jobs. New routes open up at the Wesley International Airport. Plans for the redevelopment of the Oakley Woods have been shelved. A local cricket team make it to the regional finals. And get set for a heat wave. First of all, police have released two descriptions for the two men wanted in connection with the robbery at the local jewellery store, Nichols, in the centre of town last Tuesday. At 9am, just when the store was opening, two men burst through the door and demanded bags to be filled up with jewellery. 
Although the two men were armed with baseball bats, the shopkeepers bravely attacked them and beat them off. Although the two men had motorcycle helmets on, these were knocked off during the scuffle, and the shopkeepers were able to get a good look at them. The first man is said to be about six foot in height, slight build, dark hair and a small moustache. He was wearing blue jeans, a white t-shirt and a black leather jacket. The second man is much shorter, around five foot eight, with a fat build and red hair and clean shaven. He was wearing a dark blue sweater and black jeans. They are both probably in their early twenties. The police hope to issue photofit pictures later today. The public are urged to call Wesley Police if they think they recognise either of the two men. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the news broadcast and answer questions 16 to 20. Comtech last night announced that they must release 40 workers. This was blamed on a downturn in sales and increased competition. The jobs to be lost will be a mixture of early retirement offerings and a spread from all departments in the company. Westley International Airport has been awarded by Cheap Air, the new low-cost carrier, four new routes into Europe. The new routes will be into four European countries, though the details have not yet been released. When the deals have been finalised, this will lead to a significant number of jobs. Environmentalists were delighted this morning by the news that plans by the local council to develop the Oakley Woods area have been shelved. The woods were to have been developed into a shopping area, but opposition from local residents and local environmental groups has led to a turnaround by the local council and they will now look for an alternative site. Westley Green, a local pressure group, says they are ecstatic that the council has bowed to the wishes of people in the area. Mr George Finchley, Mayor of Westley, made the announcement and said that the committee responsible took all available information into account before taking the decision and he hopes that Westley residents are happy that the local council are sensitive to their wishes when making decisions. East Moors CC, a local league cricket club, has made it to the finals of the Sunday League knockout cricket competition. They will play the final at home on Sunday 30th of August against Newbury CC. Go along and support if you're around that day, as you'll be assured a great Sunday afternoon sport. And finally, get set for a heatwave for the remainder of the month of August. Weather experts have assured us that we will have three weeks of unbroken sunshine till the end of the month. Great news, but those of us who are experienced with the British weather will most likely greet this news with, let's wait and see. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You'll hear a tutor and a student discussing transport. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Come in, John. Come in. How's the paper going? Morning, Mr. Taylor. Pretty well, actually. Good, good. It's not all about bicycles, is it? I know you've got a thing about bicycles. Yes, but that's just... There are other ways to get around town, you know. Yes, I know, and I think I've researched pretty well all of them. Right then. So your paper's about urban transport in London, eh? Not just London, but that is going to be the focus. I've also looked at urban transport systems in cities around the world. Madrid, Beijing, Mexico City, Amsterdam, Paris, other countries too. You have been busy, haven't you? What's the purpose of your study? Well, two things really. I want to see if there are more efficient ways of organizing urban transport systems while cutting down on traffic congestion, and of course pollution, and to find ways of encouraging people to use public transport instead of their cars. Let's start with that then, with cars. I think you have a hard time thinking of ways to persuade people to swap their cars for a crowded bus or underground train. They're convenient, comfortable, faster, and sometimes they're a status symbol, too. Okay, I agree that cars will probably always be the most popular means of transport. But there are ways to cut down the number of people who bring their cars into the city. It's a problem that affects every big city, and several methods have been tried. I know, I know, as I've found to my cost. When I go into London, which I do two or three times a week, I have to pay five pounds to get into the city centre. Has your research thrown up any more places where they do this? Oh, yes. Apart from London, there's Oslo, Stockholm, Singapore. Now, there, in Singapore, they've got it really organized. They've imposed a tax on all roads leading into the city centre, and they have electronic sensors that identify each car and then debit a credit card belonging to the owner. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And other cities, instead of charging motorists to come into the city center, have tried other measures. Such as? Well, in Athens, cars are only allowed to go into the city center on alternate days, depending on their license plate number. In Bogota and some other Latin American cities, such as Quinto and Sao Paulo, they've developed what is called a BRT system. A what? A BRT system, a bus rapid transit system. People leave their cars outside the city and take buses, which have special express lanes into and through the city. It's been so successful that they're trying it out in Mexico City, Beijing, Seoul, and Taipei and other cities are pedestrianizing more and more areas of the city center. I see. How have these measures affected traffic congestion and pollution levels? In most cases, it has led to a reduction in the number of cars entering the city center. Certainly in Singapore, where it's now much easier to move around the city and the air is much cleaner than most other cities in that part of the world. London, too, I believe. I can give some facts and figures if you like. Please do. In the first year after the tax was introduced, the number of people using buses to get to the city center rose by 38%. Really? 38%? Incredible. Yes, and the number of cars entering central London dropped by about 18%. 
there's more. The number of people using bicycles and mopeds went up 17%. I knew we'd get to bicycles at some point. Well, yes. In the city, the bicycle has a lot going for it. You can avoid traffic jams. There are no parking problems. They don't pollute. They're cheap to run, and they don't cost very much. Oh, and here's another fact for you. You can fit 20 bicycles in the space needed to park one car. Well, I never. But I can't see it catching on. Besides, we seem to be getting off the point. Not at all. China, Japan, and Holland have all integrated bicycles into their urban transport systems. In Holland and Japan, they've got special parking areas for commuters who get to the station by bike. And Japan has even built multi-story parking facilities for bikes close to railway stations. Then look at America. In New York, delivery services use bicycles because they can deliver messages and small parcels far more quickly and at much lower cost than cars or vans. Even the police use bicycles. In fact, in about 80% of the towns in America where the population is around half a million, the police regularly patrol on bicycles. And they have proved to be effective because they can reach the scene of an accident or crime faster and more quietly than officers in patrol cars, making a lot more arrests per officer. Well, you do know your bicycles, don't you? But I do need to hear more about the public transport system and what's to be done about that. And I'd like you to look a bit more into the economics of it, how much it will cost to improve the situation, and so on. Okay? Right. See you next Tuesday. Yes, next Tuesday. Bye, Mr. Taylor. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You'll hear a lecturer talking to a group of science students. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 34. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 34. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the science faculty. As you may know, my field of study is neurobiology, so you may be wondering what I have to say to those of you who are studying physics or chemistry or geology, even those of you who intend to become doctors. In fact, what I have to say is aimed especially at those who wish to enter the medical profession, though the main point applies to all of you. And what is my main point? Basically, it is that you shouldn't get stuck in too narrow a specialization. What I mean is, too often doctors and scientists become experts on one small aspect of their subject and neglect the rest. Perhaps you have heard the joke about a doctor being introduced to another doctor as an expert on the nose. Oh, yes, said the other doctor. Which nostril? I know that more and more it is necessary to specialize, because when you finish your studies, you have to find a place in the job market. But I do believe that it is damaging both to you personally and to the profession. You may be surprised to know how many physicians in the past were men of wide culture. 
Many were interested in the humanities, from the arts to literature to philosophy. A surprising number of them, from Rabelais to William Carlos Williams, became poets, novelists, and playwrights. Men of science have written clearly and intelligently about society, psychology, and politics. This tradition is not dead. Today, such eminent scientists as Stephen Jay Gould, Jared Diamond, and Richard Dawkins are well known as popularizers of science, while maintaining high standards. But more of them in a minute. I'm not saying that while you are studying anatomy, you should sign up for a course in English literature. But reading a few works of fiction in your own time will show you the human mind, just as your anatomy classes show you the human body. Science faculties and medical schools, it seems to me, now largely ignore this human dimension. Furthermore, the study of medicine and psychology, for that matter, is largely about what has gone wrong with the body and the mind. That is, it mostly deals with the abnormal. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions thirty-five to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-five to forty. So, to try and correct this situation, if only in a small way, I have come up with some extra reading for you to do. Don't worry, I wouldn't have chosen them if I didn't think they were enjoyable as well as interesting. The first on my list, I'm sure you've all heard of, even if you haven't read it. It's Bill Bryson's *A Short History of Nearly Everything*. Now, don't turn your noses up at it just because it's now officially a school book and is written to entertain as well as inform. In fact, I've found it a very good bedside book. Next come a couple of the writers I mentioned earlier. Any collection of essays by Stephen Jay Gould is worth reading. He writes clearly in a language non-scientists can easily understand. In fact, a lot of his essays are responses to questions about science from the general public. He's also entertaining on the subject of baseball. Perhaps you should start with Gould's wonderful life. He writes brilliantly about natural history, and shows how much imagination and excitement there is in scientific discovery. Then there's Jared Diamond's *The Rise and Fall of the Third Chimpanzee*, which shows us how close we are to the apes and forces us to look at some of the darker aspects of human nature. After reading it, you won't forget your animal ancestry, but don't let that put you off. It's very readable. You're probably saying to yourselves, "Just a minute! These are all science books." What about the fiction? I'll come to those in a later lecture. At the moment, I'm just trying to get you to read away from your chosen field of study. However, I will recommend one work of fiction now, though it might come as a bit of a surprise. If it does, it means you haven't read it. The book is *The Water Babies* by Charles Kingsley. I can see I have surprised you. Well, it is in fact the first fictional response to Charles Darwin's *On the Origin of Species*. Yes, it is a children's book, but full of surreal fantasy and wit. The fourth, no, the fifth book on the list is a biography, *The Emperor of Scent* by Chandler Burr. To my mind, it's not particularly well written, but it is a fascinating story. It is about Luca Turin, a biophysicist who becomes an expert on perfume, and about how he missed getting the Nobel Prize. 
If any of you are thinking of a career in scientific research, this book might make you think again. It's a very tough dog-eat-dog -dog business, which brings us to the book that inspired Kingsley's Water Babies, that classic of the genre, Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. If you haven't read it already, perhaps you shouldn't be here. If you have, it won't hurt to read it again. Or if you prefer, read his The Voyage of the Beagle, which as well as being of interest to any natural historian or anyone interested in scientific method, also makes a great travel book. Well, I think that's enough to be going on with, and I can see that it's time to finish up. So please bear in mind, throughout whatever course you are studying, not to neglect other aspects of your wider, non-academic education. Thank you. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.